The Private Life of Chairman Mao, The Memoirs of Mao's Personal Physician, by Dr. Li Shishui, translated by Professor Tai Hong Chao, with the editorial assistance of Anne F. Thurston, forward by Professor Andrew J. Nathan, Columbia University. Forward. No other leader in history held as much power over so many people for so long as Mao Zedong and none inflicted such a catastrophe on his nation. Mao's lust for control and fear of betrayal kept his court and his country in turmoil. His visions and his intrigues drove China through the Great Leap Forward and its terrible consequences, the Great Famine and the Cultural Revolution, with deaths in the tens of millions. Nor has any other dictator been as intimately observed as Mao is in this memoir by the man who served as his personal physician for 22 years. Suetonius' Lives of the Twelve Caesars shows the deranging effects of absolute power in the gluttony, lechery, greed, sadism, incest, torture, and commission of multiple murders by Tiberius, Caligula, and Nero, but the author did not know his subjects personally. Procopius' secret history is a scandalous attack on the Roman Emperor Justinian and his wife Theodora, devoid of sympathy or understanding. Albert Speer knew Hitler well, but their common interests were limited to public works and war. Stalin's daughter seldom saw her father. The diaries of Napoleon's and Hitler's personal physicians are merely clinical. Personal memoirs about great democratic leaders like Morin's Churchill and Herndon's Lincoln tell us less about history than the biographies of dictators do, because democratic leaders have less room to impose their personalities on events. As for the Chinese tradition, the basic annals of each reign record the rituals, portents, alliances, and memorials that made up each emperor's performance of his role, but they rarely reveal the personalities beneath the robes. Even Chinese fictionalized accounts of historical rulers, like the Romance of the Three Kingdoms, deal with types rather than characters. The combination of access and insight makes the private life of Chairman Mao unique. The real Mao could hardly have been more different from the benevolent sage king portrayed in the authorized memoirs and poster portraits that circulate in China today. To be sure, on the first meeting, he could be charming, sympathetic, and casual, setting his visitor at ease to talk freely. But he drew on psychological reserves of anger and contempt to control his followers, manipulating his mood with frightening effect. Relying on the confusion and willingness of those around him to confront their superior, he humiliated subordinates and rivals. He undertook self-criticism only to goad others to flatter him, surrounding himself with a culture of abasement. Emulating the first Tang Emperor, Mao bound men and women to him by discovering their weaknesses. Dr. Li Shishui came from an upper-class family, was trained in an American-sponsored school in Shushao, and had an early and trivial involvement with Gumendang. These potentially dangerous facts enslaved him to Mao. Corruption existed within Mao's entourage, and Mao knew it, but he needed people who could cut corners. Fish cannot live in pure water, Mao liked to say. He enjoyed swimming in polluted water and walking through fields of night soil. Mao's retainers remained on permanent probation, whatever their backgrounds. Old comrades were sent into internal exile, in some cases to their deaths, although Mao's role in these tragedies was indirect. In one scene, we see Mao sitting on a stage behind a curtain listening, unseen as two of his closest colleagues are attacked at a mass meeting. Mao controlled his top colleagues' medical care, denying some of them treatment for cancer, because he was convinced that cancer could not be cured, and he wanted them to work for the remaining time. Having lost children, a brother, and a wife to war and revolution, he seldom seemed moved by the suffering of lovers, children, and friends any more than he flinched from imposing misery on millions of the faceless masses in pursuit of his economic and political schemes. He understood human suffering chiefly as a way to control people. In politics and personal life alike, he discarded those for whom he had no present use, just as coolly calling them back when he wanted them, if they were still alive. Dr. Li usually found Mao with a book of Chinese history in his hand. He loved the traditional stories of strategy and deception. He was an expert in when to wait, faint, and withdraw, and how to attack obliquely. He liked to lure snakes out of their holes, encouraging others to show their heads so he could turn against them. His closest colleagues could seldom sense whether he agreed with them or was waiting to pounce. Dr. Lee says Mao was a marvelous actor. He could sentence a retainer to exile with a story so convincing that the victim backed out bowing in gratitude. Imperial power allowed the ultimate luxury, simplicity. 
Mao spent much of his time in bed or lounging by the side of a private pool, not dressing for days at a time. He ate oily food, rinsed his mouth with tea, and slept with country girls. During a 1958 tour of Henan, Mao's party was followed everywhere by a truckload of watermelons. Mao liked cloth shoes. If he had to wear leather ones for a diplomatic function, he let someone else break them in. He did not bathe, preferring a rub down with hot towels, although this made it hard for Dr. Lee to stop the spread of venereal diseases among his female companions. He slept on a specially made huge wooden bed that was carried on his private train, set up in his villas, and airlifted to Moscow. He exercised sovereignty over clock and calendar. The court worked to Mao's rhythm, and many of his activities took place after midnight. It was not unusual to be summoned to Mao's chamber at two or three in the morning. He traveled frequently, convening meetings of the nation's leaders wherever he was. He sought to triumph over death through Taoist methods of sex. He followed no schedule except on May Day and National Day, and on the rare occasions he received foreign visitors. Then he had to dress, taking barbiturates to control his anxiety. Women were served to order like food. While Puritanism was promoted in his name, Mao's sex life was a central project of his court. A special room was set aside in the great hall of the people for his refreshment during high-level party meetings. Party and army political departments, guardians of the nation's morality, recruited young women of sterling proletarian background and excellent physical appearance, supposedly to engage in ballroom dancing with the leader, actually for possible service in his bed. Honored by the opportunity, some of those chosen introduced their sisters. Each province's party secretary built Mao a villa. He moved from place to place partly because of security concerns, partly out of paranoia. It's not good for me to stay in one place too long, he told Dr. Lee. All rail traffic stopped and stations were closed as his special train went through. Security officers posing as food vendors lent the stations an air of normalcy for his benefit. During the Great Leap, peasants were mobilized to tend transplanted crops along miles of tracks, creating the impression of a bumper harvest when the harvest was a disaster. Mao's favorite villa was located on a small island in the Pearl River, where he enjoyed privacy in the middle of the busy city of Guangzhou. Special food grown in a labor camp near Beijing was airlifted to him and tried by tasters before he ate it. Guards cooled his room with tubs of ice. Absolute power affected Mao's mental and physical health, his human relations, and through these, his country and the world. He spent months in bed, ill with worry, but when the political struggle was going his way, he might fill up with cheerful energy that kept him from sleeping. Dr. Lee dosed him constantly with barbiturates so he could rest. Political stress sometimes made him impotent, at other times stimulated his libido. As tens of millions starved to death during the Great Leap Forward and the chairman lost face before the party, he temporarily gave up meat. But he needed more women. One of them told Dr. Lee that the great helmsman was great in everything, even in bed. Politics in a dictatorship begins in the personality of the dictator. Mao established a regime like no other, an ensemble of economic, social, and political institutions that grew from his effort to build a unique form of socialism in a country that was poor, backward, and vulnerable. Facing the hostility of the West, Mao aligned with Moscow, but his admiration for the West was one reason he chose the American-trained Dr. Lee as his physician, and was the subject of many of their conversations. He told Dr. Lee that the Americans' intentions toward China had always been benign, but he held his allies, the Russians, in contempt. Mao aimed to surpass the primitive Russian model with Chinese-style socialism, raise his country to the level of the advanced Western world, and by this achievement join the pantheon of Marxism-Leninism. The Great Leap Forward was his effort to create a model of socialism better than that of his northern neighbors, and the Cultural Revolution was his attempt to sustain the experiment in the face of its failure. In a vast continental country with a huge and poor population, Mao sought economic growth through mass mobilization, trying to substitute ideological fervor for material rewards. He froze the people's standard of living at subsistence levels in order to build a massive, wasteful industrial structure. In doing so, he ignored the realities that contradicted his vision. A farmer's son from rural Hunan, he allowed himself to be deluded by vast Potakam fields at the start of the Great Leap Forward. As Dr. Lee says, why should Mao have doubted that communist paradise had arrived when he himself was living in it? He thought there was more to learn about leadership from the pages of Chinese history than from textbooks of modern engineering. While people starved, he imagined that they had more than they could eat. The ideology that bore Mao's name promoted self-denial, defined a person's value in terms of political virtue, and dehumanized the class enemy. 
A system of work units, class labels, household registrations, and mass movements fixed each citizen in an organizational cage, within which people exercised political terror over themselves and each other. A pervading bureaucracy governed the economy, politics, ideology, culture, people's private lives, and even many of their private thoughts. The apparatus led the people in singing the praises of the regime that had expropriated them. Mao toppled the party machinery when it proved insufficiently responsive to his fantasies of speed, but rebuilt it when he needed it to stop factional violence. At the top, 30 to 40 men made up all the major decisions. Their power was personal, fluid, and dependent on their relations with Mao. Dr. Lee describes a system of central committee organs, political and confidential secretaries, bodyguards, kitchens, carpools, and clinics to serve the leaders. An underground tunnel complex allowed the leaders to move secretly from their headquarters in Zhongnanhai to buildings elsewhere in Beijing. Mao's closest retainers bugged his premises, trying to keep better records of his decisions, but found themselves cashiered for spying on him. Set up to serve and protect the leaders, the structures of power isolated them, Mao more than the others. Mao's comrades gradually ceded to him the forbidden city swimming pool, the dance parties, and the best Betahe beach. The saga of his swim in the three great rivers over the objections of his security men symbolizes his solitary struggle against the bureaucracy, his fear that the revolution might bog down, and his challenge to comrades he thought were betraying his radical aims. At the Eighth Party Congress in 1956, Mao's colleagues attempted to rein him in, taking advantage of de-Stalinization in the Soviet Union to write his guiding thought out of the party constitution, pledge the party against the cult of personality, and criticize Mao's attempts to force the premature birth of communism. Mao claimed falsely to Dr. Li that he had not been consulted about these decisions. Forces abroad also threatened his control. The new Soviet leader Khrushchev wanted an accommodation with the West. Dr. Li portrays the bitter last meeting between the two by the side of Mao's swimming pool, which marked the start of an open split with the Soviets and the onset of China's long period of isolation. Mao held fast to three ultimate tools of power, ideology, the army, and his spider's position at the center of the party's factional web. He summoned up the epical Great Leap Forward with a whistle-stop farm tour that passed a message over the heads of the economic planners to the basic level cadres. At the Lushan Plenum in 1959, when the other leaders tried to rein Mao in, he threatened to raise a new army and take to the hills. The others surrendered. After the famine began, Mao retreated to a secondary position of power. As the other party leaders restored the economy, he brooded that they were zombies and complained about their failure to consult him. He patiently ensnared them in a debate over classic operas and enmeshed them in confusion over the issue of rural corruption. When his colleagues were vulnerable enough, he launched the Cultural Revolution. Millions of victims later, Mao stood victorious at the Ninth Party Congress of 1969, his rivals dead or in internal exile, the nation singing his praises and waving his red book before his ubiquitous poster. By his side stood the abject Lin Biao, the sole survivor from the old ruling group. Mao's dream of development had failed, but his power was absolute in the country he had ruined. Lin Biao's coup attempt two years later disappointed Mao so badly that Dr. Li traces his final decline from then. He used his final energies to engineer the opening to the West, which later made possible Deng Xiaoping's reforms. Psychological pathologies flourished in the atmosphere of court politics. The more complete Mao's control, the greater his fear of others' attempts to control him. Their anxiety to please made them more suspect. He thought his villas were poisoned and panicked when he heard wild animals scratching inside the roof of one. Mao spied on the other leaders by managing their secretaries through his chief secretary and their guards through his chief of guards. Although he surrounded his rivals with his men, he was never sure they were not spying on him through his women. Mao's wife, Jiang Qing, suffered from hypochondria, aversion to noise, light, cold, and heat, and compulsive quarreling. Having driven her mad with boredom, dependency, and enforced idleness, Mao at first tried to spare her the knowledge of his love affairs. But when he needed her as a political proxy, he brought her into the inner circle. Like her equally sick colleague Lin Biao, Zhang, once in power, flowered into robust health, making friends with Mao's favorite female companion to get better access to the source of power. Dr. Li shows us Lin Biao in the arms of his wife, crying with pain from a kidney stone. Hua Guofeng, sitting in Mao's anteroom for hours unable to see the great leader because his companion and gatekeeper, Zhang Yufang, is napping. Zhou Enlai kneeling on the floor before Mao to trace the route of a proposed motorcade. Zhang Qing, in fury as a sick Mao hands control over the whole country to Zhou, 
only to recover and outlive him. Of all Mao's followers, only Zhou kept relatively aloof from the Byzantine networks that laced the court. Because he did so, Dr. Li and the other courtiers ironically viewed him as disloyal and dangerous. For Zhou to report information to appropriate colleagues in the formal chain of command struck the others as a sign of weakness and treachery. At the end, the most loved man in China was friendless. During his long decline, his servant's chief obsession was to avoid blame for his demise. Only his favorite, Zhang Yufeng, had the decency to treat him like a human being by quarreling with him, fearless of being accused of angering him to death. But as he weakened, she found other interests, having become indispensable because only she could decode his slurred speech. Dr. Lee's frank, round, slightly smiling face stands out from the rows of stony-faced retainers in the group photographs of Mao's household. His open expression, soft cheeks, and neat clothes betray him as the one who came back from the West. His foreign tincture made him doubly valuable, denoting both competence and dependency. For Mao was secure to the extent that Dr. Lee was vulnerable. Surviving under Mao's protection, he stuck to his business, maintaining the health of the man whose acts cost the lives of millions. Only a certain willingness to look away from evil can make a man the ideal guardian of a dictator's life. Dr. Lee's limits as an observer of history were one of the qualifications for his job, but politics sometimes forced itself on him. Mao sometimes insisted on talking about events or on sending Dr. Lee away from the court to observe and report. At court, Dr. Lee had to learn who protected who and who opposed him. Aside from Mao, his patron was Wang Dongjing, chief of bodyguards. Their alliance provides the book's bias, but also much of its insight into court politics. Since he left China, Dr. Lee has been all but erased from official history. Of the countless books on Mao's personal life published by Chinese presses, only one or two mention him. Apparently, there has been a central directive to treat him as a non-person. But his image survives in unretouched film footage and photos, and reliable sources confirm his identity. Official and semi-official works corroborate many details in his account, but differ from his in leaving out aspects of the story that would embarrass the regime, which still rules by the soft light of Mao's official image. No authorized account offers a portrait of Mao that rings as true as Dr. Lee's. It is the most revealing book ever published on Mao, perhaps on any dictator in history. In 1981, five years after Mao's death, the Chinese Communist Party's Central Committee adopted an official verdict on his life. Resolution on certain questions in the history of our party since the founding of the People's Republic of China. They called Mao a great revolutionary, whose contributions outweighed the cost of his mistakes. But this book tells a different story. It shows how excessive power drives its possessor into a shadow world, where great visions become father to great crimes.